Dr. Lau, thank you so much for joining us today on This Is Purdue. I know so many of our listeners connect with, with cancer on a personal level, and you've actually helped create a drug that can find these malignant tumors. Um, tell us, but let's start at the beginning. How did you get into the chemistry field? Well, actually, my father was a chemist, and he was a faculty member here at Purdue University, and actually a very famous one. And uh, as an obedient child, I took the courses in high school that I was asked to take, and he always signed me up for advanced uh, science courses. So here at West Lafayette High School, I took advanced chemistry, advanced biology, advanced physics, and all of the math courses I could take. And I wasn't stellar as a student. I mean, I I struggled through those courses. They were uh, difficult for me, but in the end, I really enjoyed chemistry the most. And so when I went to uh, BYU to uh, undergraduate school, um, I asked Dad what I should, uh, he thought I should major in. And he said, well, why don't you major in chemistry? I suspect there may have been some selfish motivation in that since he was a famous chemist. But also he pointed out to me, when you finish with your degree, in chemistry, you could go, if you wished, into business, you could go into sales, you could uh, go into medical school or dental school, or you could continue on in science and uh, uh, sharpen your chemistry skills and get an advanced degree in chemistry. And at the time, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but eventually uh, all the uh, ducks lined up for me pr- proceeding on and getting a PhD in chemistry. That's great. So you founded numerous drugs, companies, you have patents under your name. Is that kind of along the same lines as you followed your dad in those footsteps? Or what what made you so interested in innovation? Um, I think what attracted me to innovation was the opportunity to do something that matters. Um, I, a lot of Chemists are motivated by the discovery of basic principles in science that can have uh, a fundamental impact on lots of different studies. I was more motivated by doing something that would uh, save lives or help people in some way or another. And I was always very intrigued by life sciences, you know, how cells work. Uh, what caused them to be able to do so many wonderful and interesting things that cells do. And as I dug deeper, I learned, I think, a a skill that a lot of people don't learn in their research careers. And that is whenever you discover something new or um, read about something new, sit down and ask yourself the question, um, how can I use this information to do something that really matters? And as I practiced that fundamental principle, I found that simply asking that question opened up opportunities that I would have never envisioned had I not stopped to think about the potential value to humanity of the work that I was doing. And um, gradually, that just led me from initially um, working on cancer to more recently branching off into autoimmune diseases. Uh, Now we're working in uh, CNS diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and we're also working on fibrotic diseases uh, and um, bone fracture repairs and things like this. So it's actually... Uh, guided me in many areas I would have never envisioned and actually was never prepared to pursue, but had to learn on the fly because the ideas that I was coming up with uh, uh, brought me in that direction. And and ultimately, I think uh, we have over 500 patents uh, in all of these different areas. And of course, as you know, we've uh, founded six different companies, all of which are successful. And speaking of doing good, your creation most recently gaining a lot of buzz is Cytolux, Mm -hmm. which is a fluorescent um, dye. And will you explain to our listeners how this dye works? Yeah. um, 
We have taken a dye that, is, that emits light that is transparent to tissues. That is, you, it's light that will pass right through your hand, for example. It's not light that's visible to the naked eye. We have to have a special camera to, that detects it. But it is basically light, not radiation and, and the damaging uh, term of radiation. At any rate, uh, we attach that uh, near-infrared fluorescent dye uh, to a smart molecule that homes in very selectively on cancer cells. So when, they're, when the dye is piggybacked onto the, uh, this homing, this smart molecule, uh, if you inject it in, for example, into the vein of a patient that is scheduled to undergo surgery in perhaps an hour, the dye circulates through the body but only attaches to cancer cells. And so uh, when the um, surgeon opens up the patient and turns on the fluorescent light, the cancer cells glow brightly like uh, bright stars against a black background. And so this allows the cancer surgeon to identify, locate, and resect uh, all of the malignant or cancer lesions in the patient um, and avoid um, removing too much healthy tissue because the healthy tissue doesn't fluoresce but the cancer tissue does fluoresce. And um, this is a very important problem because if you look um, historically and even today, 40% uh, of recurrent cancers recur in the tumor bed that was resected or removed by the surgeon. This means that the surgeon left a lot of diseased tissue behind and that tissue grew back. And that means either another surgery or more often than not, it means uh, um, because it's only caught much later that the patient is not going to do well, maybe not survive. And so enabling the surgeon to very clearly see, they can just shave until all of the cancer tissue is removed, all the fluorescence is gone. When they see all the fluorescence is gone, they know they have removed all the cancer tissues. Kind of like painting by... Uh, numbers, colors, you know, you see right exactly what you have to do. It's a, a, a very bright visual aid to the surgeon on how to remove the cancer. And you touched on it's important not to remove, you know, blindly some of these healthy cells. Why is that? Why is it so important to just get that cancerous cells out of there? Well, um, that's a good question. In some cases, it's not as critical to be really highly precise and not removing healthy tissue. But uh, in brain cancer, uh, people are fond of their brains and <laughs> yes. want to have as much of that left over as right. they can. And uh, um, frankly, uh, in other tissues, uh, for example, in uh, breast cancer, again, uh, if the cancer can be re removed without removing extra healthy tissue, uh, the patient uh, would like, would prefer that. Um, in some cases, uh, um, resection of healthy tissue actually does serious damage in, in um, prostate cancer. For example, if a healthy nerve is accidentally severed, uh, the patient can be incontinent and impotent after the surgery. And being able to see exactly where the cancer is and not uh, cut anything that's non-malignant uh, will really benefit patients in all of these um, areas. You know. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So um, can you tell us about the difference between this targeted marker and others on the market that aren't specifically like tumor targeted? Yeah, well, there are some other fluorescent dyes that passively, passively um, concentrate to some extent in the tumor tissue. But the contrast between the uh, malignant tissue and the healthy tissue is blurred, and the boundary between the two is generally not, not very, and always not very exact. In our case, because the um, cell that our dyes bind to are malignant, and the cells that it doesn't bind to are non-malignant, the boundary between the cancer tissue and the healthy tissue is really quite sharp. So it allows the surgeon to um, really make a very exact uh, cut and, and 
preserve healthy tissue while being quantitative in removal of the cancer tissue. And can you tell us everything that went into creating Cytolux and how many years in the making was this massive project? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know where you want to start on that question. Uh, I could go way back and uh, begin with the accidental discovery of a tumor homing molecule. But, okay, Let's, uh, we have all day. We have all day you want to hear. <laughs> An interesting story. I, um, well, okay. I was studying plant cells and asking the question how these plant cells uh, detected pathogens like bacteria and viruses around because a lot of plants will wilt and, and uh, die because of a, a pathogen infection like bacterial infection. And um, so we found that if you ground up uh, some pathogenic bacteria and, and uh, spread the dust on uh, the leaves of a soybean plant, that that would uh, prevent that soybean plant from getting a bacterial infection later on, somehow immunize the plant. And we wanted to find out what, how that information was communicated from this ground up bacterial dust to the plant uh, to uh, create this immunity. And um, so I asked a graduate student to see if these, any of these bacterial pieces were carried, were captured by the plant cell and carried inside. I told him to radio label it and then see if any radioactivity went inside the plant uh, cell. And he, uh, went away and then came back and said, uh, Dr. Lau, I'm sorry, I can't do the study. And I said, well, why not? He said, because um, I don't want to work with radioactivity. <laughs> and I thought, gosh, everybody around us is doing it. and We do it all the time. But anyway, so I, I deferred to his preferences and I asked him instead to put a, a, a biotin, uh, that's a vitamin, uh, and attach that to some of these bacterial pieces and see if that went in. He did and it went in. We celebrated, hey, that shows how this signaling is taking place. But then I told him to conduct what we call a control study where you show that it really is recognizing the bacterial piece. So I said, now put biotin on um, insulin. Plants don't have insulin. And I told him to put it on bovine serum albumin. That's just a protein in the bloodstream of cows and show that it doesn't go in because we knew they, did, they didn't do anything to plants. And he put the biotin on those two proteins and they went in too. So this is how science works. <laughs> and he came back, he was terribly disappointed and uh, said, Dr. Lau, uh, we were wrong, the experiment didn't work. The biotin linked cow protein and the biotin linked insulin also went in. I said, uh, Mark, you uh, have just discovered a, a vitamin uptake pathway in plants. The plants are taking up the biotin because they can take up a biotin-linked cow protein, a biotin-linked human protein, and biotin-linked bacteria. <laughs> to make a long story short, we decided to find out if animals had that capability too. So we looked at animal cells and then we jumped to folate, another vitamin. And by the way, animal cells did have that. And when we jumped to folate, we found out that only cancer cells had the ability to take up folate. Wow. And that was a breakthrough by accident, I must confess. But that started my first company, Endocyte. We used folate uh, to deliver attached drugs very selectively to cancer cells, avoiding uptake and the associated toxicity when uh, you know, a good drug goes into healthy cells. And that made a huge difference. And so the whole process got started by an accident, but um, the uh, outcome was that we noticed that something useful could be developed out of that accident. And from folate, we went to lots of other homing molecules, and now we have a whole toolbox of homing molecules that we can use to target drugs to as I said, not only cancer cells, but um, cells involved in all the fibrotic diseases, the autoimmune diseases, the CNS diseases, bone fractures, um, even um, inherited diseases and things of this sort. So we're covering a whole realm of uh, human diseases based on the principle that if you can concentrate a good drug specifically in the disease cell and not have it 
taken up in healthy cells. You'll improve the potency of that drug and reduce its toxicity to healthy cells, make, making the drug far better than it was before. And all six of my companies are founded or built on that principle. Wow. And so through all this trial and error uh -huh. and all this innovation and in science, yeah. that's exactly, like you said, that's how science works. So that was a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, so this drug just went through the clinical trials process. Yeah. Can you explain everything that goes into that? Yeah. Um, well, initially, the whole discovery process uh, uh, is usually begun with a concept that you have, for example, a homing molecule, and why not use that to color cancer cells or make them glow like light bulbs so that the surgeon can see it. And so the first step is to do the chemistry in the laboratory, which we did. And the second step was to culture cancer cells in a little dish. And what we did, the initial study that we did was we cultured cancer cells in a dish in the presence of healthy cells in the same dish. Uh, and they were human cancer cells and human healthy cells. We added our tumor targeted fluorescent dye, let it sit there and, and bathe all the cells, both the cancer and the healthy cells. And then after a few minutes, we washed off the, the uh, solution on the top and looked at them under the fluorescence microscope and only the cancer cells glowed the healthy cells did not. So we thought, by golly, we've got something important there, right? Uh -huh. Then the next step was to take it into animals and the animals that we used, we implanted into them um, human cancer cells. So we used special mice actually that would not reject the in implanted human cancer cells. And we, we looked to see when we injected into the tail vein of these mice, would this fluorescent dye only go to the growing cancers? And indeed, we confirmed that, that they just went specifically to the growing cancers. Then we went to some um, naturally occurring uh, cancers in dogs that came into the uh, veterinary clinic and just looked to see if we could uh, help there in helping the surgeons there find the malignant lesions in these uh, pet animals and it worked there and then we had to prepare it for human clinical trials that's a long involved process you have to uh, demonstrate that you can reproducibly uh, manufacture your drug exactly the same many times over so that they know that if you run these trials every patient's going to get the same molecules uh, next you have to show that it's stable then you have to show in two different animal species that it's not toxic so we did it in mice and in dogs. Then you have to show that it can be um, uh, very antiseptically bottled and stored and that it's stable during storage and, and, uh, and filling. And we had to do that. And finally, we had to submit what's called an IND, uh, in an investigational new drug application. We submitted that to the FDA with all of these data and obtain permission to begin trials in humans. But then when you start in humans, you have to start at a very, very low dose and a dose that's far too low to even have any uh, benefit. So the first few patients receive so little of this targeted fluorescent dye that you can't see anything. But we just wanted to make sure that they uh, didn't uh, have a fever, have accelerated heartbeat, or had, you know, uh, any adverse events. And so we gradually escalated the dose. And in the process, we reached a concentration of drug that was very effective in revealing the tumors, but not causing any associated collateral toxicity. That, that ended phase one. Then phase two clinical trials focus on... Um, finding really the precise dosing conditions more exactly and to give you the best contrast between the tumor and the healthy tissue. Then the phase three trials were just to test in a large population of patients that exact condition that we believe works best. And then we test that in 150, 200 patients. And we show that we are able to 
find uh, malignant lesions in these patients that would otherwise gone undetected. And then it results in the, the ovarian cancer trial that has completed and was given expedited review by the FDA uh, because it looked so impressive. The results were very impressive. In other words, the surgeon never knew it was there, turned on the fluorescent lamp and wow, there's some extra cancer in there. They cut it out. They sent it off to the pathologist. The pathologist says, yes, that's cancer. And so that confirms that the dye enabled the surgeon to find cancer that was otherwise undetectable in the patient. I have so many follow-up questions, I'm not sure which one to ask. Um, how did you feel when this was finally, you know, being tested on humans? And like you said, it's a matter of, it's quite literally a matter of life and death, especially in these aggressive cancers like ovarian cancer. What, what were you feeling like when this all kind of was coming to fruition? Well, it was, I must confess, a eureka moment. Um, bringing it to the stage was certainly a, a difficult journey. I was not very familiar with the process, and not, not at all, actually. And so, to be honest, um, I and my colleagues at both Endocyte, my first company, and on Target Labs, the second company, to some extent went through the school of hard knocks, making mistakes that a more experienced uh, um, drug discoverer <laughs> wouldn't make. But um, I learned a lot in the process. I'm not making those mistakes with my uh, subsequent companies. And I think that uh, I've, you know, what I've learned will greatly benefit me in avoiding similar pitfalls in the future and moving drugs more rapidly from discovery through to a clinical application. And so with my more recent drugs in these other areas where the sailing has been a lot smoother, let's just say that. Sure, sure. I uh, took the data and showed it to a lot of surgeons. And it was interesting, the surgeons told me, oh, we don't need this, we can find the cancer very easily. We're We've been doing this, you know, for all our lives. And I heard that over and over again for about eight years. I would present the data uh, showing these very specific uh, fluorescent images of animals and where only the tumor fluoresced. And they in, in no way disputed the fact that we could cause the tumors to fluoresce, but they were not convinced that it, it would help them. And then a surgeon over in the Netherlands saw the data at one of my talks and said, oh, this is terrific. Let's do something with this. And so they introduced it into human clinical trials and it was in ovarian cancer patients. And we published the data in a very prominent uh, scientific journal called Nature. And um, the results showed that they were able to find five times more malignant lesions with the aid of the fluorescent dye than without it. <laughs> and that 100% of these fluorescent lesions were cancer. And did you bring that back to the U.S. and <laughs> yes. say, see, I told you. <laughs> that really that really created a stir. I mean, it really proved um, unequivocally in a well-run well clinical trial that the surgeons really couldn't find all the cancer and that there was a lot that was being left behind that they didn't know about. And so that changed actually the field. That, that paper was the first paper using a, a uh, tumor-targeted fluorescent dye in humans. And um, so at that point, we were able to raise a lot of money. And uh, that, uh, that was back in 2008. Uh, we created a subsequently a much better fluorescent dye and I think we patented that in about 2013 or 14, 2014. And that's the fluorescent dye that uh, just received expedited review by the FDA and should be approved within a couple of months. So this has been a very long process, almost 20 years. Do you foresee this drug being used in other cancers besides ovarian? Yeah, we're, um, it, will, it is being used currently in phase three clinical trials for 
um, resection of lung cancer. And the data there are equally impressive, but I'm not allowed to disclose them, but I can say that with some confidence that it's going to also uh, change the surgery for lung cancer. Um, after that, we have a different dye that we've designed that is very specifically useful for prostate cancer. And that's gone through the phase one clinical trial stage uh, and the data are looking very promising there. We have others lined up in, um, in the uh, refrigerator, <laughs> basically, that we've designed and tested in animals that look very good for other cancers. And I think very soon we'll have a toolbox of these fluorescent dyes, maybe four or five that collectively will cover essentially all human cancers. Was there a reason that you chose ovarian cancer in particular to start with? Um, yeah, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, ovarian cancer had this, the receptor, we call it, that was recognized by this smart fluorescent dye. Um, the second reason was that ovarian cancer is a very um, um, insidious cancer. It um, emerges or is first detected usually only in stage three or stage four where it's already spread. And I think the average survival is five years. And um, that's because it's been historically almost impossible to find the the metastatic lesions. It spreads throughout the peritoneal cavity in little uh, small uh, malignant nodules. And uh, some of them are buried underneath the uh, viscera and the intestines, the walls of the peritoneal cavity on, you know, in different surfaces. And it's just almost impossible to find. But if you turn on this fluorescent lamp, and we have videos of this, you can see the surgeon moving the viscera around. And, oh, there's a fluorescent spot, so they cut that out, and then they move it around. There's another fluorescent spot. These spots that are these nodules are often just, um, you know, a, a tenth of an inch or less in size. But if you let them go, they'll grow huge, and um, so they would normally go undetected because they look exactly like healthy tissue. You really can't distinguish them when they're that small. They're not a bump, they're just smooth, and uh, they don't feel hard or anything like that. So anyway, uh, it seemed like a particularly um, difficult cancer to uh, successfully resect surgically, and so it was a good place to demonstrate the benefit of having a tumor targeted fluorescent dye. Sure. So you mentioned before that now that you've gone through this process once with with your other companies now coming up, you have um, a greater knowledge of all of this. Where do you think that drug discovery will be in you know five or even ten years? I don't know. Um, you know, I'm getting old, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my days are long still, and. Uh, Everybody keeps asking me, when I, am I going to retire? I have a, a problem. I'd like to retire, but I have lots of ideas. And most of these ideas are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm not sure exactly um, what the future holds for me, to be honest with you. Um, I've, um, you know, we've been very successful. Uh, both uh, scientifically and financially, and I don't have any problem getting st companies started anymore. Not only uh, do I have a lot of ideas, but it's a lot easier once you've been successful with one or two companies to go out and raise money for funding the um, drug discovery projects and the additional companies. Um, for example, our Third a company is developing a um, tumor-targeted immunotherapy that takes a patient's immune cells and puts in a new gene that enables them to very aggressively attack only cancer cells. And uh, we went out and uh, within a few months raised uh, over $250 million for the company. Oh my. <laughs> and when we first, uh, just in comparison, when I f 
founded Endosite, my first company, it took me quite a while to raise one and a half million dollars. <laughs> so now you're just a pro. So, you know, we're, well, it's, uh, it's easier once you've been successful. Uh, the major investment banks and venture capitalists uh, call you instead of you calling them. <laughs> <laughs> It's going right back to your dad being a famous chemist. It's another famous chemist. So um, what do you think the most gratifying part of all of this has been for you? Well, I, I, I think it's been very gratifying to be able to help people. Um, I just uh, watched a video of a lady from uh, the Philadelphia area who was so thrilled that uh, the surgeon there, Janos, Dr. Janos Tanyi, was able to find uh, significant extra uh, disease tissue in her that would have gone undetected otherwise. And uh, she listed off all of the different activities she was engaged in and how important her, uh, you know, her ability to interact with these um, um, charitable organizations and these volunteer activities and so forth and her grandchildren and so forth. And just, I was just, uh, I guess, overwhelmingly uh, rewarded by just seeing that, you know, what we likely did there was to give her an extra, you know, maybe 15 years or whatever to be able to carry out all of these wonderful activities that she was engaged in. I think that's the most most rewarding aspect of it all, yeah. And I've heard you have very strong ties to Purdue. You talked yeah. about you went to West Lafayette High School. Your yeah. dad was a yeah. chemist here at Purdue. Yeah. Why did you choose to come back here and work here? Um, well, it was the it was it was a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I uh, when I first started looking for faculty positions, um, I only had one other job offer, and uh, it was obvious. My parents lived here. I grew up in the town. I, I liked uh, West Lafayette very much, so I decided to come back, and uh, yeah, it was the obvious choice. <laughs> and I'm sure other people were trying to poach you as you got more and more successful. Yeah, I've, I've been obviously um, given many offered many offers to move to other places. And uh, I, um, I grew up uh, a very avid Purdue fan. When I was a kid, my dad used to usher at the basketball and football games. And uh, as a good father, he bought me tickets so that I could go along with him. He, I, and uh, so I went to all the basketball and football games starting from the earliest days I remember. And I grew up an avid Purdue fan. It's interesting. Here's a Here's a personal story that you might find uh, interesting. I played basketball at West Lafayette High School and uh, was fairly good, okay. <laughs> and um, I got a basketball scholarship to BYU, okay. And I did play there, okay. And uh, when um, I got my job at Purdue, um, shortly afterwards, uh, BYU came out to play basketball here. I had tickets for the game, and uh, so um, um, I wasn't sure who I was going to root for. <laughs> and when the uh, opening tip-off went up, uh, immediately I was a Purdue fan. <laughs> <laughs> did you wear Purdue colors? I don't think I, I did. You stayed myself at the time. Okay. Yeah. But I do now. You stayed in neutral. I have okay. full wardrobe. And as a matter of fact, all of my kids have Purdue rooms in their oh. homes where they have all the Purdue paraphernalia that we send them and so forth on the walls. So, yeah. Are you still an avid sports fan here? Yeah, I, ha I, I have tickets to both basketball and football games. Awesome. Yeah. And what do you think, um, like when it comes to drug discovery work being done at Purdue versus other universities, mm -hmm. How does Purdue stay at the forefront of all of this? Well, um, I think Purdue made a decision, and maybe it was just intrinsic in the nature of the university many, many years ago to um, embrace the use of science for practical applications. Uh, maybe this stems from the heavy focus on engineering, which is really an application 
directed science. Um, maybe it was the decision of earlier administrators, I don't know. But um, in many uh, schools, finding a useful application for your discoveries is considered prostituting yourself, yourself for filthy lucre. <laughs> it's, it's beneath the dignity of a good scientist to do something of that sort. In Purdue, it's not frowned on. As a matter of fact, it's encouraged. Now, in all fairness, I will tell you that that attitude has changed 180 degrees at almost all the universities. But when I first founded Endocyte at Purdue, even Purdue was skeptical about the um, compatibility of having a faculty member also engage in private enterprise. And I had to go up through the department head first who discouraged me from doing it, then to the dean who also discouraged me to, from doing it. It went to the president and the president had just returned from a trip out to Stanford where they were already beginning to do it. And he said, well, why not let him try? And so I was given permission and we founded Endocyte. I think it was the, um, the first, or if not one of the, not the first, one of the very first companies. It was 1995 and it uh, was one of the first companies to be founded based on Purdue technology. And uh, since then, as I say, I've had uh, over 500 patents, all of, almost all of them through Purdue University. And Purdue's going to benefit financially a lot from these, I think. But also, I, uh, there's been a lot of benefit to the university in terms of the training that students have obtained in my lab, and in terms of the uh, visibility that it brings to the university, uh, in terms of the money it brings into the university, because it's uh, my lab is extremely well supported now. We occupy this entire top floor here, and. Uh, that money has come in because of the interest from industry in supporting all of the work that we're doing. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, a win-win situation for the faculty member and the university to promote this within the, you know, appropriate limitations and restrictions. I think those are important too. Just imagine if you had stopped when those two levels of people said, don't do it. I mean, yeah. look at all these things you've created. So what would you say to a future student who might be thinking about coming to Purdue to pursue science? Oh, I think Purdue's a great place for an education in science. I think it's terrific. They focus on the STEM curricula and the, um, I think the atmosphere of encouragement for translating your discoveries into something useful is very prominent and helpful here. My personal belief is it's the only way science is going to survive in the future. Um, the, um, I think we have to demonstrate that public support of science is going to pay the public back. It's in their benefit to do so. And for many years, it wasn't obvious. We would discover new fundamental principles, publish them in journals using language that only your colleagues would understand. And no one who, you know, worked at the local factory and, you know, came home and watched ball games on TV had any idea of how that might benefit them. And frankly, in many cases, it didn't. But now with this emphasis on finding some practical use for your discoveries, I think it will become very obvious that Purdue University and other uh, comparable universities can become an economic engine for the uh, state and local area. And what does it mean to you, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but to, to have all this success and, you know, like you said, financially, and you've created all these different things, but more importantly, you've saved and you're going to save hundreds of thousands of lives. Yeah. What does that mean to you? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to answer it any differently than it is very gratifying. Uh, it's uh, very rewarding. And it's um, nice to know that you have, can leave a footprint on the planet when you leave. <laughs> and I, 
I think we'll be able to um, say that we've done that and uh, feel comfortable that we've made a contribution to humanity. And this is an easy one. Why are you proud to be a Boilermaker? <laughs> <laughs> I like Purdue. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Lau, where does the name Cytolux come from? Well, the prefix CYT is uh, a, um, comes from the Latin for cell, and lux comes from the Latin for light. Uh, and so what you have is a, a lighted cell, <laughs> and that's where the name stems from. One has to get these names approved through the FDA. Um, you can't uh, actually claim any outcome or benefit with a name. So usually you go to companies that know what will be allowed and what won't be, and you select four or five and send them to the FDA with your preference, and the FDA then approves them or disapproves them. And this was approved. I like it. I do too. It's, it's easy to say. Some of the drugs that come on TV are like, what? <laughs> so, okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think it was wonderful. Um, I, uh... <laughs> A true boiler maker. <laughs> That's the Purdue fight song on my cell phone. <laughs> I love it.